next talk for this evening um, is on how to get to Mars in all of, um, in very interesting ways. Um, some of them might be really, really slow. Uh, our next speaker um, has studied physics and has a PhD in math and is currently uh, working as a mission planner at the German uh, Space Operations Center. Please give a big round of applause to Sven. Thank you. Hello and welcome to uh, Thrust is not an option, how to get to Mars really slow. Uh, my name is Sven, I'm a mission planner uh, at the German Space Operations Center, which is a part of the DLR, the Deutsche Zentrum für Luft- und Raumfahrt. And first of all, I have to apologize because I kind of cheated a little bit in the title. Uh, the accurate title would have been uh, Reducing Thrust, How to Get to Mars, or maybe Mercury, really slow. The reason for this is that um, I will actually uh, use Mercury as an example quite a few times. And also, we will not be able to actually get rid of all the maneuvers uh, that we want to do. So um, the goal of this talk is to give you an introduction to uh, orbital mechanics, to see what we can do, what are the techniques that you can use to actually get to another planet, to bring a spacecraft to another planet, and also uh, go a few more, uh, go a bit further into some more advanced techniques. So um, we will start with uh, well, gravity and the two-body problem. So this is the basics, the underlying uh, physics uh, that we need. Then we will talk about the two main techniques, maybe to get to Mars, for example, the Hohmann transfer, as well as gravity assists. The third point uh, will be an extension of that that's called the planar circular restricted three-body problem. Sounds pretty complicated, uh, but uh, we will see in pictures uh, what it is about. And then we will uh, finally get a taste of um, certain ways to actually uh, be even better, be even more efficient by looking at uh, what's called ballistic capture and the weak stability boundary. All right, so let's start. First off, uh, we have gravity, and we need to talk about the two-body problem. So I'm standing here on the stage, and I'm actually being, well, accelerated downwards, right? The Earth actually attracts me, and this is the same thing that happens for any two uh, bodies that have um, mass, okay? So they attract each other by gravitational force, and this force uh, will actually accelerate the objects towards each other. Um, notice that the force actually depends on the distance, okay? So it doesn't, we don't need to, do, need to know uh, any uh, details, but in principle, the force gets stronger the closer the objects are, okay? Good. Um, now, we can't really analyze this whole thing in, any, in, in every detail. So we will make a few assumptions. Um, one of them will be that all our bodies, um, so in particular the Sun, Earth, will actually be points, okay? So uh, we will just consider points, because uh, anything else is too complicated for me. Also, uh, all our satellites will actually be just points. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, in principle, you have to deal with uh, the attitude of the satellite. So, for example, a solar panel needs to actually point towards the sun. Uh, of course, that's complicated, so we will skip this for this talk. Third point is that n uh, none of our planets will have an atmosphere, so there will be, won't be any friction anywhere in, in the space. And the fourth point is that uh, we will mostly restrict to movement uh, within the plane, so we only have like two dimensions uh, during this talk. And also I will uh, kind of uh, forget about certain planets and other uh, uh, masses from time to time, okay? Uh, I'm mentioning this because I do not want you to go home this evening, uh, start planning your own interplanetary mission, then maybe building your spacecraft tomorrow, launching in three days, and then a week later I get an email, hey, you, I, this d didn't work. I mean, what did you tell me? Um, okay, so if you actually want to do this at home, don't try this just now, but uh, please consult your local flight dynamics department. Uh, they will actually supply you with the necessary details. All right, so. Uh, what's the two-body problem about? So in principle, we have some body, the sun, and the spacecraft that is being attracted by the sun. Now, the sun is obviously much heavier than a spacecraft, meaning that uh, we will actually uh, neglect the force that the spacecraft exerts on the sun. Uh, so instead, the sun will just be like, it will be at some place, it will, might move in some, some way, or a planet, uh, but we only care about the spacecraft in general. Um, furthermore, notice that um, if you specify the position and the velocity of a spacecraft at some point, then the 
gravitational force will actually determine the whole path of the space spacecraft for all time. Okay, so this uh, path is called the orbit, and this is what we are talking about. Yeah, so we want to determine orbits. We want to actually find ways how to efficiently change orbits in order to actually reach uh, uh, Mars, for example. Um, there's one other thing that you may, may know uh, from your day-to-day -day life. Um, if you actually take an object and you put it high up and you let it fall down, then it will accelerate. Okay, so um, one way to actually describe this is uh, by looking at the energy. Yeah? There is a kinetic energy that's related to movement, to velocity, and there is a potential energy which is related to this gravitational field. Um, and the sum of those energies is actually conserved. This means that uh, when the spacecraft moves, um, uh, for example, closer to, to the sun, then it, its potential energy will decrease and thus the kinet kinetic energy will increase. So uh, it will actually get faster. So you can see this, for example, here you, we have two bodies that uh, rotate around, around their uh, center of mass. And uh, if you're careful, if you're looking careful, um, when they actually approach each other, then they're quite a bit faster. Okay, so this is important to keep in mind. All right, so, so how, how do spacecrafts actually move? Uh, so we will now actually assume that uh, we don't use any kind of engine, no thruster, we, we just cruise along the gravitational field. Um, then there are essentially three types of, of uh, orbits that we can have. One of them are hyperbola. So this case happens if the velocity is very high, because those are not um, periodic solutions, they're not closed, so instead our spacecraft kind of approaches the, the sun or the planet in the middle, in the center, uh, from infinity, it will kind of well, turn, it will uh, change its direction, and then it will leave again to infinity. Another orbit that may happen is a parabola. Uh, this, this is kind of similar. Actually, we won't encounter parabolas during this talk, so I will skip this. Uh, and the m probably most common orbit that we all know are ellipses, in particular circles, because, well, we know that uh, the Earth is actually uh, moving around the sun approximately in a circle. Okay, so those are periodic solutions. Um, they uh, they are closed, and in particular, they um, they are such that if a spacecraft is on one of those orbits and it's not doing anything, then it will forever stay on that orbit. Okay. In the two-body problem. Yeah. So now the the problem is um, we actually want to change this. So we need to do something. Okay. So we want to change from one circle around the Sun, which corresponds to the Earth orbit, for example, to another circle around the Sun, which corresponds to the Mars orbit. And in order to change this, we need to uh, do some kind of maneuver. Okay? So this is an actual picture of a spacecraft. Um, and what the spacecraft is doing, it's emitting some kind of particles in some direction. Yeah? They have a mass m. Uh, those particles might be gases or uh, ions, for example. Uh, and because uh, these, these gases uh, or these emissions, they, they carry some mass, they actually have some uh, momentum due to conservation of momentum. This means that the uh, spacecraft actually has to accelerate in the opposite direction. Okay? So whenever we do this, we will actually uh, accelerate the, the, the spacecraft and change the velocity. And this change of velocity uh, is denoted by delta v. And delta v is sort of the, the basic... Um, uh, quantity that we actually want to look at all the time, okay? Because this describes how much uh, thrust we need to actually apply um, in order to, uh, well, change our orbit. Uh, now, unfortunately, it's pretty expensive to, uh, well, to apply a lot of delta V. This is due to the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation. So the fuel that you need in order to reach or to, to change your velocity with some delta V, this uh, depends essentially uh, exponentially on, on, the, uh, on, on the target delta v. So this means we really need to take care that we use as uh, few delta v as possible in order to reduce uh, the, the needed fuel. Um, there, there's, well, one reason for that is, well, we want to maybe reduce costs, you know, because then we need to carry less fuel. However, um, we can also actually think the other way around. If we actually use less delta, f uh, less less fuel, then we can bring more stuff for uh, payloads, for missions, for 
uh, science experiments. Okay, so um, that's why uh, in, in, in spacecraft um, mission design we actually have to c take care of reducing the amount of delta v that is spent during maneuvers. So let's see what can we actually do. So one example of a, a very um, basic maneuver is actually to well sort of raise the orbit. So imagine you have a spacecraft in a circular orbit around, for example, uh, Sun here. Um, then you might might want to um, well raise the orbit in the sense that you make it more elliptic and reach higher altitudes. Okay, and for this you just accelerate in the direction that you're flying. So, so you apply some delta v, and this will actually change the form of the ellipse. Okay, so that's a very common scenario. Another one is uh, if you approach a planet from very far away, then you might have a very high relative velocity, uh, such that with respect to the planet, you're on a hyperbolic orbit. Okay, so you would actually leave the planet. However, if this is actually your, your target planet that you want to reach, then of course you have to enter orbit, you have to somehow slow down. So the idea here is that you, when, when you approach the closest point to the uh, to the planet, for example, uh, then you actually slow down. So you apply delta v sort of in the op opposite direction and change the orbit to something that you prefer, for example, an ellipse, because now you will actually stay close to the planet forever. Okay? Well, if reality would be a two-body problem. Okay, so let's continue. Um, now we actually want to apply this knowledge to, to well, getting, for example, to Mars. Uh, let's start with Hohmann transfers. Um, Mars and Earth both well, evolve around the Sun in pretty much uh, circular orbits. And uh, our spacecraft starts at the Earth. So now we want to reach Mars. How do we do this? Well, uh, we can apply what we just said. So we accelerate when we are at the, at the Earth orbit such that, the, uh, such that our orbit touches the uh, the Mars orbit on the other side, okay. So this gives us some amount of delta v that we have to apply. Yeah, we need to calculate this. I'm not going to do this. Um, then we actually fly f around this orbit for half an ellipse, and once we have reached the Mars orbit, then we can actually accelerate again in order to raise the other side of the ellipse until that one reaches uh, the Mars orbit. Yeah. So with two maneuvers two accelerations, we can actually change from one circular orbit to another one. Okay? And this is the basic idea of how you actually fly to Mars. So let's look at, a, uh, at an animation. Um, so this is the orbit of the InSight mission. Uh, that's a NASA uh, Mars mission, which launched and landed last year. Um, the blue circle is the uh, uh, Earth, and the green one is Mars. And the pink uh, is actually the, the uh, satellite. Uh, or the probe. Um, you can see that, uh, well, it's flying in this, this sort of uh, half ellipse. Um, however, uh, there are two, well, there's, there's one problem. Namely, when it actually reaches Mars, uh, Mars needs to be there. I mean, that sounds trivial, yeah, but I mean, imagine you fly there and then, well, Mars is somewhere else. Um, that, that's not good. Um, I mean, this, this happens pretty regularly when you begin playing a uh, Kerbal Space Program, for example. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so, so we don't want to uh, like, like, uh, play around with this uh, the whole time. We actually want to, to hit Mars. Um, so uh, we need to take care that Mars is at the right position when we actually launch, yeah? because it will traverse the whole green line during our transfer. Uh, this means that we can only launch uh, such a Hohmann transfer at very particular times. Uh, and sort of this, this time when you can do this transfer is called a transfer window. And um, for Earth-Mars, for example, uh, this uh, is possible every 26 months. So if you miss something, yeah, software is not ready, whatever, then you have to wait for another uh, 26 months. So, um, yeah, and the flight itself takes about six months here. Yeah. All right. Um, there's another thing that we kind of neglected uh, so far. Namely, when we start, at, well, when we depart from Earth, then, well, there's Earth mainly. Yeah? So that's the main source of gravitational uh, of gravitation force. Um, for example, right now, I'm standing here on the stage and uh, I, I, mean, I, I experience the, the Earth. Uh, 
I also experienced Sun and Mars, but I mean, that's very weak. Yeah? I can ignore this. So at the beginning of our uh, mission to Mars, we actually have to take care that we, that we are close to Earth. Then during the flight, the Sun actually dominates uh, the, the gravitational force, so, so we will only consider this. But then when we approach Mars, we actually have to take care about Mars. Okay, so we kind of forgot, forgot this during the Hohmann transfer. So um, what you actually do is you patch together solutions of these uh, transfers. Yeah, so in, in this case, there are, there are essentially three uh, sources of uh, gravitational force, so Earth, Sun, and Mars. So we will have three two-body problems that we need to consider. Yeah, one for departing, one for the actual home and transfer, and then uh, the third one uh, when we actually approach Mars. Uh, so this makes this whole thing a bit more complicated, but it's also nice because actually we need less delta V than we would for the basic uh, Hohmann transfer. One reason for this is that when we look at Mars, so uh, the green line is now um, uh, the Mars orbit and the red one is again the, the uh, spacecraft, it approaches Mars, then we can actually look at what happens at Mars by kind of zooming into the, the system uh, of uh, of Mars, okay? So Mars is now standing still, and then we see that the velocity of the spacecraft is actually very high relative to Mars, so it will be on a hyperbolic orbit, yeah? it will actually leave Mars again. You can see this on the left side, right? Because it's leaving Mars again. So what you need to do is, in fact, you, you need to slow down and change your orbit uh, into an ellipse. Okay? And this delta V is that, you, that you need here for this maneuver is actually less than the delta V you would need to, to circularize the, the uh, orbit um, to, to just fly uh, in the same orbit as Mars. Um, so we need to slow down. A similar argument actually at Earth uh, shows that, well, if you actually launch into space, then you, you need quite some speed already to not fall down back onto Earth. Yeah, so that's something like seven kilometers per second or so. Um, this means that you already have some, some speed, okay? And if you align your orbit or your launch uh, correctly, then you already have some of the delta V that you need for, for the Hohmann transfer. So uh, in principle, you need uh, quite a bit less delta V than, than you might naively think. All right. Um, so that much about uh, Hohmann transfer, let's look at gravity assists. That's another major technique for interplanetary missions. The idea is that um, we can actually use planets to sort of getting pulled along. Yeah, so this is an animation. Um, on the lower, in the lower animation you see um, kind of the, the picture when you look at the planet, so the planet is standing still, uh, and we assume that the spacecraft, so the blue object, is on a hyperbolic orbit and it's kind of making a 90 degree turn, okay? Uh, in the upper image you actually see uh, the, the um, well, the, the picture when you look from the sun, so the planet is actually moving and if you look very carefully at the blue um, uh, uh, object then you can see that it is faster, yeah? So once it has passed, uh, the planet is actually faster. Um, well, we can actually look at this problem, yeah? So this is again the picture. Um, when Mars is centered, we have some entry velocity, then we are in this hyperbolic orbit, and we have an exit velocity. Um, notice that uh, the lengths are actually equal, so it's the, same, uh, it's the same speed, but just the turn direction in this example. But then we can look at the whole problem with the moving Mars. Okay? So now Mars has some velocity, V Mars. So the actual velocity that we see uh, is the sum of the entry in the Mars velocity before and afterwards exit plus Mars velocity. And if you look at those two arrows, arrows then you see immediately that, well, uh, yeah, the lengths are different, okay? So this is just the whole, whole phenomenon here. Um, so we see that um, by actually passing close to such a, well, planet or massive body, we can sort of gain free delta V, okay? So uh, of course it's not, I mean, there, uh, energy is still conserved, okay? But um, yeah. Let's not worry about these details here. Um, now, the nice thing is we can use this technique to actually alter course. We can speed up, so this is the example that I'm shown here, but also we can use this to slow down, okay? So that's a pretty common application as well. Uh, and we can use this to slow down by just, uh, well, uh, changing the arrows, essentially, you know? So, so just approaching Mars from, in this case, Mars uh, from a different direction, essentially. 
so let's look at an example. Um, and this is uh, BP Colombo. Uh, that's actually the reason why I uh, kind of uh, changed the title, because BP Colombo is actually a, a mission to Mercury. Okay, so it was launched last year. Uh, it's a combined ESA-JAXA mission. And it consists of uh, two probes and one thrust, essentially. So it's the thru three stages that you can see in the picture. Um, yeah, and that's a pretty awesome mission, actually. It's really nice. Um, but it has, in particular, a very cool orbit. So that's it. Um, what can we see here? So first of all, the blue uh, line, that's actually Earth. The green one, that's Mercury. So that's where we want to go. And then we have this uh, intermediate trickiest one, um, that's uh, Venus. And, well, the, the pink curve is uh, Baby Colombo's orbit, so it looks pretty complicated. Yeah, it's definitely not a Hohmann transfer. And, in fact, this uh, mission uses nine gravity assists to reach Mercury. And if you, if you look at, at the path, so, for example, right now, yeah, it, it actually um, is very close to Mercury, because the last five or six um, uh, gravity assists are just around Mercury in order to slow down. Okay? Uh, and this saves a lot of delta V compared to the uh, standard um, uh, Hohmann transfer. All right. But we want to do, do even better. Okay? So let's now actually make the whole problem more complicated in order to hope for some kind of nice tricks that we can do. Okay? So now we will talk about the planar circular restricted three-body problem. All right, so in general, the three-body problem just means, hey, um, well, instead of two bodies, we have three. Okay, and they pairwise attract each other, and then we can solve this, this uh, well, equation of motion. We can ask a computer, and this is one animation of, of what this could look like. So there are three masses, uh, and, and their orbits are traced. Um, and we see immediately that we don't see anything. That's super complicated. Yeah. Um, there is no way we can really, well, I don't know, formulate a whole solution theory for, for, for a general three-body problem that's complicated. Those are definitely not ellipses. So let's maybe go a step back and make the problem a bit easier. Okay, so we will now talk about the planar circular restricted three-body problem. Uh, there are three words. So the first one is restricted. Restricted means that uh, in our application case, one of the bodies is actually a spacecraft. Spacecrafts are much lighter than, for example, Sun and Mars, meaning that uh, we can actually ignore the force that uh, the spacecraft exerts on Sun and Mars. Okay? So we will actually consider Sun and Mars uh, to be independent of the spacecraft. Okay? So in total, we only have like two gravitational forces now acting on a uh, spacecraft. Yeah? So we neglect sort of this, this other um, uh, force. Also, we will assume that the whole problem is uh, what's called circular. So we assume that Sun and Mars actually rotate in circles around their center of mass. Um, this assumption is actually pretty, pretty okay. Uh, we will see a picture right now. So uh, in, in this graph, for example, uh, or in this image, you, you can see the, the black situation. Yeah? So this might be at some, uh, time, some point in time, and then later on, the Sun and Mars actually have moved to the red positions and uh, the spacecraft is at some other place and now, of course, feels some other forces. Um, okay. And also, uh, we will assume that the problem is planar, meaning, again, that uh, everything takes place in the plane. Okay. So, let's look at the video. Uh, that's a video with, with a very low uh, frame rate, something like two images per day, maybe. Um, it's actually Pluto and Charon. So the larger one is, is the uh, well, X, X planet uh, Pluto. Um, it's, it was taken by New Horizons in 2015, and it shows that they actually rotate around their well center of mass. Yeah, so both actually rotate. Um, this also happens, for example, for Sun and uh, Earth, or Sun and Mars, or Sun and Jupiter or also Earth and Moon. However, in those other cases, the center of mass is usually contained in the larger body. Yeah, so this means that in, in the case of Sun, uh, Earth, for example, uh, the Sun will just wiggle a little bit. Okay? So the, you don't really see this, this extensive um, rotation. Okay, now, um, this problem is still difficult. Okay? So if I put now a mass in there, then, well, um, yeah, you don't really know what happens. However, there's a nice trick to simplify this problem. 
Um, and unfortunately, I can't do this here, but uh, maybe uh, all the viewers um, at home, they can try to do this. Uh, you can take your laptop. Please don't do this. Um, and you can rotate your laptop uh, at the same speed um, as this image actually rotates. Okay. Um, well, then what happens? The two masses will actually stand still from your point of view. Okay. If you do it carefully and don't break anything. So we switch to this sort of rotating point of view. Okay. Then the two masses stand still. We still have the two gravitational forces towards Sun and Mars. Uh, but because we kind of look at it from a rotated or from a from moving point of view, we get two new forces. Those forces you know. Yeah? So the centrifugal force is, of course, the one that, for example, you have when you play with, uh, I don't know, with uh, some children or so, yeah? and they want to uh, be pulled in a circle very quickly, and then they start uh, flying, yeah? and that's pretty cool. But here we actually have this force acting on the spacecraft, okay? And also there is the Coriolis force, um, which is a bit less known. Um, this depends on the velocity uh, of, the, of the spacecraft, okay? So if there's no velocity in particular, then there will not be any Coriolis force. So our new problem actually has four forces, okay? But the advantage is the Sun and Mars actually are standing still. So we don't, uh, we don't need to worry about their movement. Okay, so now how does this look like? Uh, this might be an example for an orbit. Well, that looks still pretty complicated. Uh, I mean, this is something that you can't have in a two-body problem. Um, it, it, it has these weird wiggles. I mean, they're not really corners. Um, it actually kind of switches from Sun to Mars, yeah? so it stays close to Sun for some time, and then it moves somewhere else. Uh, so that's still pretty complicated. Um, I don't know, m maybe some of you have, have read the book... Uh, uh, the three-body problem, yeah. So there, for example, um, the the two masses might be a binary star system, okay, and then you have a planet that's actually moving along such an orbit, okay. That looks pretty bad. So in particular, uh, the seasons might be somewhat uh, messed up. <laughs> yeah. So this problem is in fact, in a strong mathematical sense, chaotic. Okay. So chaotic means something like. Uh, if you start with very close initial conditions and you just let the system evolve, then the solutions will look very, very different. Okay? And this really happens here, uh, which is good. All right, so one thing we can ask is, well, um, is it possible that if we put a spacecraft into the system without any velocity, is it possible that all the forces actually cancel out? Uh, and it turns out, yes, this is possible, and those points are called Lagrangian points. Uh, so, if we have zero velocity, there is no Coriolis force, so we have only these three forces. Uh, and, and as you can see in this, this uh, uh, little schematics here, um, it's possible that all these forces actually cancel out. Now, um, imagine, uh, yeah, I gave you homework, uh, please calculate all these possible points. Then you can do this, but we won't do this right here. Instead, we just look at the uh, result. So those are the five uh, Lagrangian points in this problem. Okay? So we have L4 and L5, um, which are at equilateral triangles with Sun and Mars. Uh, well, Sun and Mars in this case. Um, and we have L1, L2, and L3 on the line through Sun and Mars. So if I put a spacecraft precisely at L1 without any velocity, then in relation to Sun and Mars, it will actually stay at the same position. Okay? That's pretty cool. However, mathematicians and physicists will immediately ask, well, okay, uh, but what happens if I actually put a spacecraft close to a Lagrangian point? Okay, so this, um, this is uh, related to what's called stability, and you can calculate that around L4 and L5, uh, the spacecraft will actually stay in the vicinity. So um, it will essentially rotate around the Lagrangian points. So th those are called stable. Whereas L1, L2, and L3 are actually unstable. Um, this means that if you put a spacecraft there, then it will eventually uh, escape. However, um, it, this takes a different amount of time depending on the Lagrangian point. So for example, if you're close to L2, this might take a few months. But uh, if you're close to L3, this will actually take uh, something like 100 years or so. Okay? So those points are still different. All right. Okay. So um, is there actually any evidence that they exist? I mean, maybe I'm just making this up and um, 
you know, I mean, I haven't shown you any equations. I could just show anything. However, um, we can actually look at the solar system. Uh, so this is the inner solar system here. In the middle, you see, uh, well, in the center, you see the sun, of course. And to the lower left, uh, there's Jupiter. Now, if you imagine an equilateral triangle of sun and Jupiter, well, there are two of them, and uh, then you see all these green dots there. And those are asteroids. Yeah? So those are the Trojans and the Greeks. And they accumulate there because L4 and L5 are stable. Okay? So we can really uh, see this dynamics going on in the solar system. However, uh, there's also uh, various other applications of, of Lagrangian points. So in particular, you might want to put uh, a space telescope somewhere in space, of course, in such a way that uh, the sun is not blinding you. Well, uh, there's Earth, of course, so if we can put the spacecraft uh, behind Earth, then we might be in, uh, in the shadow. And this is the Lagrangian point L2, which is uh, the reason why th this is actually being used for, for space telescopes, such as, for example, this one. Uh, however, it, it turns out so L2 is unstable, so we don't really want to put the spacecraft just there, uh, but instead we put it in, a orbit close, in a closed orbit close to L2. Uh, and this particular example is called a halo orbit, and it's actually not contained in the plane, so I'm cheating a little bit. Yeah? So on the right-hand side, you, you, in the animation, you actually see the, the orbit from the side. So it actually leaves the plane. Uh, the blue dot is Earth, and uh, on the left-hand side, you see the, the, um, the actual uh, orbit from, from the top, so it's rotating around uh, this place. Okay, so that's the James Webb Space Telescope. By the way, uh, you can see in the animation uh, it's supposed to launch in 2018. Um, that didn't work out, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned. Um, another example um, that's, uh, that has become uh, pretty famous recently is the Chinese Kikiao uh, Relay Satellite. Um, this one sits at the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point. And the reason for this is that the Chinese wanted to, or actually did, land uh, the Chang'e 4 moon lander on the backside of the moon. Uh, and in order to stay in contact, in radio contact with the lander, they had to put a relay satellite behind the moon, which they could still see from, from Earth. Uh, and uh, they chose uh, some similar orbit uh, around L2. Okay. So let's now uh, go to uh, some other more advanced technique. Ballistic capture. Um, Right, okay. So this whole business sort of started with a uh, mission from the beginning of the 1990s, and that's the Heaton mission. So there was a Japanese, uh, well, moon probe. It consisted of a probe uh, which had a small orbiter inside, uh, which was separated, and then uh, it was supposed to actually uh, enter orbit around moon. Unfortunately, it missed its maneuver, yeah? so it didn't apply enough delta V, so it actually uh, flew off. And the mission was sort of uh, lost at that point, because Heaton itself, so the main probe, did not have enough fuel to reach the moon. All right? That's, uh, of course, a problem. Yeah? I mean, it's a risk you have to take. Um, and they were probably pretty d devastated. However, there were two people uh, from JPL, uh, NASA, uh, who actually heard about this, uh, Bruno and Miller, and they uh, were working on strange orbits, those uh, ballistic uh, capture orbits, uh, and they actually found one for the Heaton probe. Um, they sent this to, uh, to the Japanese, and uh, they actually used that orbit to get the Heaton probe to the moon. Uh, and it actually arrived in October 1991, um, and then they could, it could do some science, yeah, maybe some, some different experiments, but uh, it actually arrived there. Uh, however, the transfer took quite a bit longer. So a normal uh, moon transfer takes like three days or so, but um, this one actually took a few months. All right. And the reason for this is that it looks pretty weird. So this is, uh, this is a picture of, of the orbit, or a schematic picture. Um, you can see the Earth, uh, well, they're in the, in the middle, sort of, uh, and the Moon a bit to the left of it. Um, the L2 is the Lagrangian point of the Sun-Earth system, okay? So it's pretty, pretty far out. And you can see that the orbit sort of consists of two parts. Um, first, it leaves Earth 
and it flies far beyond the moon, yeah? so somewhere completely different towards some other Lagrangian point uh, that's, that's really far away. Uh, then it does some weird things, and in the upper part of the picture, um, th there it actually does a maneuver, so we apply some thrust, some delta V, to change on a different orbit, and this orbit uh, led the probe directly to the moon, where it was uh, essentially captured uh, for free. Okay, so it just entered orbit around the moon. And this is of course not possible in the two-body problem, but we may find a way uh, for doing this in the three-body problem. Okay, so uh, what do you mean by capture? Um, now we have to sort of think a bit, a bit, yeah, a bit more abstractly. The idea is, uh, well, we have Sun and Mars, and we have a spacecraft that flies in this uh, three-body problem. Uh, so the red orbit is actually the orbit of the spacecraft. Um, now, at, at any point in time, we may decide to just forget about the Sun. Okay? So in, instead, we consider the, the two-body problem of Mars and the spacecraft. Okay? Because at this uh, point in time, the spacecraft has a certain position relative to Mars and a certain velocity. So this determines its orbit in the two-body problem. Usually, it would be very fast, so it would be on a hyperbolic orbit, uh, which is uh, denoted by the dashed line here, okay, or a dashed curve. Um, so usually, you, you happen to be on a, on a hyperbolic orbit, but of course, the orbit is only an approximation because in the three-body problem, the, the movement is actually different. But later on, it might happen that um, we continue on the orbit, we can do the same kind of construction, but just looking, but just ignoring the sun, essentially, uh, and then uh, we could find that the spacecraft suddenly is in a uh, elliptic orbit. This would mean that, uh, well, if we forgot about the sun, then the spacecraft would be uh, stable. Yeah, it would be captured by by Mars. It would be there. That would be pretty nice. Um, so this this phenomenon, when this happens, uh, we call this a temporary capture. Okay, temporary because uh, it might actually leave. Uh, that situation again later on, yeah? because the, the actual movement depends on the three-body problem, which is super complicated. So it's possible that it actually leaves again. But for that moment, at least, it's captured. And we want to find a way or, or describe some kind of algorithm, perhaps, um, how we can, uh, well, find this situation, essentially, okay, in, in, a, in a reasonable way. And the notion for this is uh, what's called, uh, well, instability. Um, the idea here is the following. Uh, we look at the three-body problem. We want to go to Mars. So we pick a line there. And on that line, we take a point X, which has some distance R to the Mars. And uh, we pick a perpendicular speed, a perpendicular velocity to, to the line, uh, such that uh, this corresponds to some kind of elliptic orbit in the two-body problem. Okay, So that's the dashed line. But then we actually look at the problem in the three-body uh, problem, and we just evolve the, uh, the spacecraft. Yeah? And it's following the red orbit. It, it might follow the red orbit, OK? Uh, and it can happen that after going around Mars for one, uh, one time, uh, it hits again the line, OK? Then we can do the same construction with uh, forgetting the, the, the sun again and just look at the two-body problem. And it's possible that this point actually still corresponds to an elliptic orbit. That's somewhat interesting, right? Because now this means that uh, if we actually uh, hit the point x, then we can follow um, the, the orbit. And we know that we wrap around Mars once and uh, are still sort of captured in the corresponding two-body two body problem. Okay? Uh, if we actually are able to uh, wrap around Mars twice, then we would call this two stable, and well, for more rotations, then it's n stable. Okay? So that's good, because such an orbit corresponds to something that's usable, because we will wrap around uh, Mars n times. However, uh, it's also possible that you have an unstable point, uh, meaning that we again start on something that corresponds to an ellipse around Mars, but if we actually follow the orbit in a three-body problem, it will, for example, not come back, it will not wrap around Mars, it will go to the Sun or somewhere else. Okay, so that's, that's of course, not a nice point. This one's called unstable. Um, and then there's another thing we can do. 
that's actually a pretty common trick in uh, finding orbits, etc. Um, we can, instead of um, uh, solving the problem in forward time, we actually go back. Okay, so essentially in, in your program, yeah, you, you just replace time by, by minus time, for example, and then you just solve the thing and you go back in, uh, uh, in the past. And it's possible that a point uh, that corresponds to, to, to such, an, such an ellipse, um, when you go back into the past, then it does not wrap around, but it actually goes to the sun, for example. We call this unstable in the past. Okay, so that's just some random definition. Um, and uh, we can, well, we can use this. The reason for this is um, we can actually uh, kind of take this, uh, these concepts together and build an orbit from that. The idea being um, we pick a point X that is uh, unstable, so for example it might wrap around Mars six times, well, some number that we, that we like. This is the blue part here in the picture. So it wraps around Mars six times. But th when we go back in time, uh, it actually uh, leaves Mars, or it, at least it doesn't come back in such a way that, that it's uh, uh, again on an elliptic curve. Um, uh, so this is the red part, OK? Well, um, so we can just follow this. And then we pick a point Y uh, on that curve, OK? So this one will be pretty far away from Mars or we can choose it, yeah. um, uh, and then we sort of use a Hohmann transfer to get from Earth to that point Y, okay? So our orbit actually consists of three parts now, okay? So we have the Hohmann transfer, but it's not actually aiming for Mars, it's actually aiming for, for the point Y. Then there we do a maneuver because uh, we want to switch onto this, this uh, uh, red orbit, Okay, and then this one will bring us to the point X, uh, where we know, because it was constructed in this way, that the spacecraft will continue um, to rotate around uh, Mars, for example, six times. Okay, so in particular at, at X, there is no maneuver taking place. Okay, um, so that that's uh, a possible mission scenario. Um, the way this is done then usually is uh, you, you kind of uh, you calculate these, these points X that are suitable for doing this. Okay, so uh, they have to be stable and unstable in the past at the same time, so you have to find them, and there's a lot of numerical uh, computations involved in that. But once we have this, um, you can actually build these, these orbits. Okay, so let's look at an actual example. Uh, so this is uh, for Earth Mars. Um, on the left, you see uh, well the, the two circular orbits of Earth and Mars. Um, and on the right, you see the same orbit, but from a point of view centered around Mars. Okay? And the colors correspond to each other. So the mission starts on the left side by doing a Hohmann transfer. So that's the black line starting at Earth and then hitting the point, uh, which is called XC here. So that's the Y that I had on the other slide. Um, so this, is pr this point Y, or XC here, uh, is pretty far away still from Mars. There we do a maneuver and we switch onto the red orbit, which brings us to the point X um, closer, to, uh, closer to Mars, afterward, after which we will actually start rotating around Mars. And the point X is actually at the top of this picture. Okay? Um, and then on the right, you can see, uh, yeah, you can see the orbit, and it's looking pretty, str uh, pretty strangely. Yeah? So the, the red orbit is when we kind of the, the capture orbit, uh, our way to actually get to Mars. And then, if you look very carefully, you can count um, we we actually rotate around Mars uh, six times. Okay. Now during those uh, six rotations around Mars, we could do experiments. Yeah. So maybe that is enough for whatever we are trying to do, okay? However, if we want to stay there, uh, we need to actually uh, execute another maneuver, okay? So to actually uh, stay around Mars. And I mean, the principle looks nice, but of course we have to do some calculations. We have to find some, some ways to actually uh, quantify how good this is. Um, and it turns out that um, uh, there are a few parameters that you can choose. So in particular, the, the target point X, uh, 
this has a certain distance that you're aiming for at around Mars. And it turns out that this procedure here, for example, uh, is only very good um, if, the, if this altitude, this distance r, is actually high enough. Uh, if it's high enough, then you can save, uh, in principle, up to 23% of the delta v, which is enormous. Okay? So that's, uh, that would be really good. However, in reality, um, it's not as good usually. Yeah? And for a certain uh, lower distances, for example, uh, you cannot save uh, anything. Uh, so uh, there are certain trade-offs uh, to make. Um, however, there's another advantage. Remember this point Y. We chose this along this capture orbit, along the red orbit. Uh, and the thing is, we can actually choose this freely. This means that our Hohmann transfer doesn't need to hit Mars directly when it's there, so it doesn't need to aim for that particular point. It can actually aim for any point on, on that uh, capture orbit. Uh, this means that we have many more Hohmann transfers uh, available that we can actually use to get there. This means that we have a far larger uh, transfer window. Okay, so we cannot just start uh, every 26 months, but now we, with this technique we could actually launch, uh, well, quite often. However, uh, there's a little problem. Uh, if you looked at the graph carefully, um, then you may have seen that uh, um, the, the red orbit actually took like three quarters of the rotation of Mars. Uh, this corresponds to roughly something like 400 days. Okay, so this takes a long time. So you probably don't want to use this with humans on board uh, because they have to actually wait for a long time. But in principle, there are ways to uh, make this shorter. So you can try to actually uh, improve on this. But in general, it takes a long time. So let's look at a real example for this. Uh, again, that's baby Colombo. Uh, the green dot is now Mercury, so this is kind of a zoom of the, of the other um, animation. And the purple line is the orbit. And yeah, it looks strange. Um, so the, the, the first few um, uh, well movements around Mercury, uh, they are actually the last um, uh, uh, gravity assists for slowing down. Okay, And then uh, it actually starts on the on the capture orbit, yeah. So now it actually approaches uh, Mercury. So this is the the part that's sort of difficult to find, but which you can do with the stability. And once the the animation actually ends, this is when it actually reaches the point reaches the point when it's temporarily captured. So uh, in the in this case, um, this is at an alt uh, altitude of 180,000 kilometers. So this is pretty high up above Mercury. But it's enough for the mission, okay? And of course, then they do some uh, uh, some other maneuver to actually stay around Mercury. Okay. So um, in the last few minutes, let's have a look. Uh, let's have a brief look at how we can actually extend this. Um, so I will be very brief here um, because well, we can try to actually make this more general to improve on this. Um, this concept is then called the interplanetary transport network. Um, and it looks a bit similar to, to what we just saw. The idea is that, uh, in fact, this, this capture orbit is part of a larger, um, well, a set of orbits that have these kinds of properties that they wrap around uh, Mars and then kind of leave Mars. And they are very closely related to, to the dynamics of uh, a particular Lagrangian point, in this case L1. So that was the one between the two uh, masses. Um, and if you investigate uh, this Lagrangian point a bit closer, uh, you can see uh, well, you can see different orbits of uh, all kinds of behaviors. And if you understand this, then you can actually try to do the same thing on the other side of the Lagrangian point. Okay, so uh, we just kind of switch from Mars to the Sun, and we do a similar thing there. Yeah, we, we expect to actually find similar orbits that are wrapping around the Sun and then going towards this Lagrangian point in a similar way. Well, then we, we already have some orbits that are, uh, well, kind of meeting at L1. Um, so we might be able to actually connect them somehow, for example, by a maneuver. And then we only need to reach the, the orbit around Earth, uh, around Sun from Earth. Okay, um, if you find a way to do this, you can get rid of the Hohmann transfer. And this way you reduce your delta V even further. The problem is that this is uh, hard to find, yeah, because these, these orbits there are pretty uh, rare. 
Uh, and of course, you have to connect those orbits. So um, they, you approach uh, the Lagrangian point from L1, from two sides, uh, uh, but you, you don't really want to wait forever until they, it's very easy to switch or so. Uh, so instead, you apply some delta V, okay, uh, in order to, well, not wait that long. So here's a picture of how this might look like. Well, again, very schematic. Um, so we have Sun, we have Mars, uh, and in between there's the Lagrangian point L1. The red orbit is sort of an extension of, of uh, one of those uh, capture orbits that we have seen. Okay, so it wraps around Mars a certain number of time times, and uh, well, in the past, for example, it actually goes to the Lagrangian point. I didn't explain this, but uh, in fact, there are many more orbits around L1, uh, closed orbits, but they are all uh, unstable. And these orbits that are used in, in this interplanetary transport network, um, they they actually um, approach those uh, orbits around L1. And we do the same thing on the other side, on the Sun. Yeah. And then the idea is, okay, uh, well, we take these orbits, we connect them, and uh, when we are on the, on, the, on the black orbit around L1, we actually apply some maneuver, we apply some delta V to actually switch from one to the other. And then we have sort of a connection of how to get from Sun to Mars. So we just need to do a uh, similar thing again from for Earth to, to this particular blue orbit around the Sun. Okay, so that's the general procedure, but of course it's difficult and in the end you have to do a lot of numerics because, uh, yeah, as I said at the beginning, uh, this is just a brief overview. Uh, it's not all the details. Uh, please don't launch your, uh, your own mission tomorrow. Okay, so with this I want to thank you and I'm open to questions. So thank you, Sven, for an interesting talk. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have any questions, uh, line up next to the microphones. We'll start with microphone number one. Hello. Um, so what are the problems associated? So you showed in the end this going around the Lagrange point L1. Mm -hmm. are there, is this also possible uh, for other Lagrange points? So could you do this with L2? Uh, yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in principle, um, I didn't show the, show the, the, the whole picture, but um, uh, these, these kind of orbits, they exist uh, at L1, but they also exist at L2. And in principle, you can this way sort of leave the, uh, this, this uh, two-body problem uh, by finding similar orbits. Uh, but of course, the, the details are uh, different, so you cannot really take your knowledge or your, your uh, calculations from L1 and just take them over to L2. You actually have to do the same thing again, you have to calculate everything in detail. We'll take a question from the internet. Is it possible to, do you, to use these kinds of transfers in Kerbal Space Program? <laughs> uh, okay. So, well, so Hohmann transfers, of course, um, the, um, uh, the gravity assist as well, but not the restricted three-body problem because uh, the way uh, Kerbal Space Program, at least the, the, the default installation, so without any mods, works is that it actually switches the gravitational uh, force. So uh, the thing that I described uh, as, as a patch solution, where we kind of switch our picture, um, which uh, gravitational force we, we, we consider for our two-body problem, this is actually the way the physics is implemented in uh, Kerbal Space Program. Uh, so we can't really do the interplanetary transport network there. However, I think there's a mod that allows this, but your computer might be too slow for this. I don't know. Um, if you're leaving, please do so quietly. Small question. And a uh, question from microphone number four. Hello. I have actually Hi. two questions. I uh, hope that's okay. Uh, first question is, uh, I, I wonder how you do that in like your practical calculations. Like you said, there's a two-body two body problem and there's solutions that you can, you can calculate with a two-body problem and then there's a three-body problem. And I imagine there's an n-body problem all the time you do things. So how does it look when, when you do that? And the second question is, you said that um, uh, reducing delta V about 15% is enormous. Uh, and I wonder how, what effect does this have on the payload? Mm -hmm. Okay, so regarding your first question, um, so in, in principle, I mean, um, you, you make a plan for a mission, 
so you have to uh, well you 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 calculate uh, those those things in, in these simplified models okay you kind of you patch together an idea of what you want to do but of course in the end you're right uh, there are actually many uh, uh, massive bodies in the solar system and because we want to pre pre be precise we actually have to incorporate all of them so in the end you have to do an actual numerical search in in a much more complicated n body problem yeah so with i don't know 100 bodies or so um, and you have to incorporate other effects yeah for example uh, the, the solar uh, radiation might actually uh, have a little influence on your orbit okay uh, and there are many effects of this kind. So once you have a r rough idea of what you want to do, you need to take your very good physics simulator uh, for the n-body problem, which actually has all these other effects as well, and then you need to do a numerical search over this. Yeah, you, kind of, you know where to start with these ideas, where to look for solutions, but then you actually have to just try it and, and figure out some algorithm to, to actually well, approach a solution that has the behavior that you want. Yeah, but it's a lot of numerics. Right, and uh, the second question, can you write me again? Sorry. What was uh, the second question? second question was um, an re reducing delta V ah. about 15%. What, what is the effect on, on the um, payload? In the right, uh, so, I mean, well, if you need 15% less fuel, then, of course, you can uh, use 15% more weight for more mass for the payload, right? So you could put, put maybe another instrument on there. Another thing you could do is actually uh, keep the fuel, but actually use it for station keeping. Um, so, for example, in the James Webb uh, telescope example, um, the, the James Webb telescope flies around this halo orbit uh, around L2, uh, but that orbit itself is unstable. So uh, the James Webb tel telescope will actually uh, escape from that orbit. So they have to do a few maneuvers every year to actually stay there. And they have only a finite amount of fuel, so at some point uh, this won't be possible anymore. So reducing data V requirements might actually have uh, uh, increased the, the, the mission lifetime by quite a bit. Number three. Uh, hey, Hi. Uh, when you do such a mission, I guess you have to adjust the tra trajectory of your satellite quite often because nothing goes exactly as you calculated it, right? And yes. My question is how precise can you measure the orbit, uh, sorry, the position and the speed of a spacecraft at, let's say, Mars? Mm -hmm. like what's the resolution? Um, right, so for Mars, I'm not completely uh, sure how precise it is, but uh, for example, if you have an uh, Earth observation mission, so something that's flying around Earth, then you can have an orbit, uh, a, a rather precise orbit that's good enough for taking pictures on Earth, for example, for something like uh, two weeks or so. Yeah. So you can, you can measure the orbit uh, well enough and, and, and uh, calculate uh, the future, uh, something like two weeks uh, in the future, okay? So that's, uh, that's uh, good enough. However, um, yeah, the, the, uh, I can't really give you uh, good numbers on, on what the accuracy is, but uh, depending on the situation, yeah, it, it can get pretty well for Mars, I guess. Uh, well, that's pretty far, I guess, the, will be a bit less. A very short question for microphone number one, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a small question. As you said, you roughly plan um, the trip using uh, the three-body and two-body problems. And uh, are there any um, stable points like Lagrangian points in a, for example, four-body problem? And can you use them to during the roughly planning stage uh, of uh, yeah, uh, I actually wondered about this uh, very recently as well, and I don't know the answer. Uh, I'm not sure. So the three-body problem is already uh, complicated enough from a mathematical point of view, uh, so I have never actually really looked at the four-body problem. However, um, with those many uh, bodies, there are at least very symmetrical solutions, yeah, so you can find. So, but it's a different thing than, than, than uh, Lagrangian points. Yeah. Right. So, unfortunately, we're almost out of time for this talk. Uh, if you have more questions, I'm sure Sven will happy, be happy to take them of after course, the yeah. talk. Uh, so please approach him after. And again, a big round of applause for an interesting talk. Thank you.